What is up, everybody, and welcome to the Mind, Body, and Pockets podcast, where we take lessons learned from people in the marching arts community to help you level up your life. I'm Eddie. And I'm Paula. And on this podcast, we're going to get to know the individuals who make up the marching arts community. They'll share their experiences in and out of the activity and the mental, physical, and financial lessons they've learned along the way. Today, we have Bill Muter on the MVP podcast. Bill is a multi-instrumentalist, best-selling author, producer, and educator known as the Tuba Visionary. He joined the drum corps community in 2001, marching five seasons with the Boston Crusaders. After aging out, he joined the cast of the Emmy and Tony award-winning show Blast, where he toured for six years, performing throughout North America, Japan, and South Korea. Bill has also taught multiple drum corps, including the Boston Crusaders, Crossman, and the Colts, and is currently a show designer and arranger for various ensembles across the country. Today, he's going to share the ups and downs of his unique journey, along with plenty of tips and strategies to help freelance artists succeed. Please help us in welcoming to the podcast, Mr. Bill Muter. The Bill Muter in the building, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, man. How have you yeah, been? It's going well. It's going well. I could be I could be much worse off right now than than I am. So I'm you know, Bill. We love you, buddy. He's a great friend of ours. We've been roommates. We've toured the world together. We've taught together. Yeah. So we, we go way back, way as back, they say. Sure. Um, so it's just great to have you on. You're going to drop some knowledge. You are one of the most incredible freelance artists who has just forged this path for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just so happy that you're here to help encourage the community out there. There's a lot of freelance artists, whether you're a musician or whatever you're doing. And especially during these times, um, it's tough, but just that choice of a career path, um, it's not for the thin skinned. So Bill's here today no. to just uh, enlighten us and share some tips and tools uh, if you're a freelance artist and we're super excited to have you here. Awesome, yeah, thanks for having me. It's for great sure. to be on here. You guys have been killing it with this thing and, and some some big names and guests to live up to. So I hope I don't crash and burn now. <laughs> I think we're good. No, you're on that oh, list, yeah. buddy. For sure. Yeah. Welcome. And it, it's crazy, too, because we've been thinking about that. Like, man, we've really done a lot with this, man. We've watched you do a lot. We've watched you really forge mm -hmm. this path. Mm -hmm. And, like, that hasn't been... This hasn't been done before, you know, and it's it's an honor to have you in our lives. It's yeah. an honor to be acquainted with you and having done so much stuff with you. And mm -hmm. it's it's going to be really cool to actually dive deep into your story, because though we know you so well, there's some stuff we almost maybe haven't really dived yeah, deep I'm, into I'm, before. I'm hoping to, uh -oh. to get some new information, yeah. which I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So let's let's jump into it. So, yeah. You were born in Boca Raton, Florida, so fellow Floridian over here. It's yes. not, not too many of us who were born here and stay. Yeah. Yeah. So what was it I'm like? like Eddie. Well, yeah, this guy coming down, the snowbird. Yeah, only when it's sunny <laughs> and I'm older and I can enjoy yeah, it, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, but you grew up in Boca. How was it growing up in South Florida, and when did you first start to get into music? South Florida, I mean, I grew up in suburban Boca Raton, and a lot of people know Boca Raton because it's kind of the uh, the ritzy, uppity area of South Florida. Um, so as a kid, like most kids and growing up in South Florida, I wanted to get out. It's funny because everybody comes here to retire, but like <laughs> when you grow up here and you're young, you're like, I got to get out of here. Like, mm -hmm. it's fake. It's not real. I got to go someplace else. And I, I mean, I've always felt that way since I was young, which kind of propelled me to, to do touring years later. But it was it was a great setup growing up. And I, especially just getting into music, um, you know, my, my mother was a musician in church and I was kind of brought up in that environment when I was young and, um, I was encouraged early on to participate. So, you know, she'd always have a guitar, she'd play guitar, um, and play music. And actually her best friend was my first music teacher. And she was also like the music minister at our church and stuff. So that was kind of like the early introduction of music. So before I started in and band and got typecasted to the tuba because of my weight. Uh, <laughs> oh. I was I was early on, you know, involved in music, taking drum lessons, playing a little bit of guitar and just, 
you know, kind of around it. And everybody, the cool thing about where I grew up is everybody in the neighborhood played something. Like that was kind of like the hang. So the next door, the guy next door to me, there was two brothers and one played bass guitar and one played uh, drum set and tuba. And that was like, whoa, that was like kind of the intro to me. <laughs> awesome. Like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. The, like guy came home with a sousaphone one day when I was in fifth grade. I'm like, yo, that that looks dope. Like, nice. What mm -hmm. is that? I was definitely fortunate that way to be able to have like that environment to just come up in and play music and yeah. and not have any sort of pretense. You know, it was just like we would jam and we all played some different stuff. And and, um, and we had a band. I had a rock band named Signal 20, that mm -hmm. which meant like. I think it's like the police code for crazy person. Nice. <laughs> so uh, such a teenager yeah. kind of name. Yes, <laughs> yes. When I had hair, I had like the blonde tips. Like it was awful. Insert but, uh, bill photo here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. It's gonna be great. But yeah, I was definitely fortunate with with the situation, just being in a musical environment, and you know, having parents and and family and siblings and and friends that just helped foster that setup. That's cool. Well, from there, like I guess. Where did the the like want to join that band or do that drum corps or you know take this thing to the next level? Where did that urge come from? Well, I I was actually held back in school. They used to have this thing called pre first. Like, if you couldn't color inside the lines in kindergarten, they're like, all right, you you can't go to first grade, so you go to pre first. And pre first was like the coolest thing. It was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because you literally all we did was play music all day. The teacher was a mu the music teacher at the elementary school, who was also my mom's, you know, closest friend, and we did that all day long. So I think that that started the bug in me, like I want to mm -hmm. do this, and and keep doing this. So I, I, you know, I did the the usual route in elementary school. I played like recorder and stuff, and started drum lessons when I was in third grade, I think. And then when I got to to middle school, I knew I wanted to do band at that point. Like some of my friends are already in it, so. You know, we do this instrument fitting, and that's why I say they like kind of typecast to me, but because you know, <laughs> like the blonde flute girls, like, oh, you're gonna play flute, you know, like the overweight kid, like, oh, you're gonna go play tuba, and like mm. the kid who talks too much is gonna be in percussion and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I went in and I wanted to play drums. Like I knew all my rudiments. I was already like, I can do this, and um, so there's like, okay, you can you can audition, but you have to try five other instruments. So I tried like two others and then i picked up the tuba and i played a low b flat i was like ah and just centered this low b flat and like sorry that's that's your <laughs> instrument now like you're, that's that's what you're, you're gonna play stuck, kid yeah yeah i was definitely stuck but uh but that's when i got the bug and i i had really great music teachers like early on and uh in middle school that would play a lot of recordings for me that like i geeked out i remember like the first marching band experience for me was was hearing actually Florida State marching chiefs like because they would just play these recordings in class. I thought it was the coolest thing, like hearing this huge ensemble of sound, this college marching band. And that that was the bug. Once I got that, that was it. There was there was no turning back. That's um, awesome. But yeah, man, it, it it was all it was all in those early days. And just I, I, I can't remember a time where I wasn't like into it. So it wasn't i don't think it was ever like a decision like i'm gonna do music now it was just like if i don't do music what else am i gonna do yeah. it was more of that so it was like all right you're gonna go and do band because that's that's what you do you know mm -hmm. and cool. you, you you make those friendships with all the the kids that are like-minded and enjoy playing and it's just yeah it's a cool hang it's it's it makes you feel like you're a part of something because you you are yeah, yeah. and you know people people don't judge you in that environment like it's just can you play? Can you not play? Cool. Mm. All right. Then you're in the hang. Like it's not to me, like if you're a young kid going into school, like high school and middle school can be ruthless, you know, and in that environment in a great band program, it's like an open door. And you guys know that like yeah. it's beautiful. And that's what it was for me. Definitely. It's like a little safe space for, for a lot yeah. of us. So. Yeah. You focus on similarities, like similarities in that room versus the differences. So if you hit, yeah. if you nail that B flat and everyone's like, Burr! it's like, oh, that's. Yeah. I can contribute. Sweet. Let's do yeah. this. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That was it, man. I play that note and they're like, oh, <laughs> that's it. You're a tuba player. And they, they, I remember the guy told me, he's like, that's a scholarship instrument. I'm like, what does that even mean? Scholarship <laughs> instrument. They're like, you're playing. And I was like, once someone like complimented me and said, oh, that was really good. I was like, Ooh, I gotta, it was like a high. I'm like, I gotta mm -hmm. do that again. I gotta yeah. figure out how to, to get people excited about music again. And then get excited about the tuba. <laughs> like, yeah, yes. that's a task in itself for but sure. You but. can see where that spark yes, happened. That's, though. that's really mm -hmm. cool. 
Awesome. That's the daily struggle. Get people excited <laughs> about the tuba. Well, let's talk about that. So what got you really excited about the tuba enough to say, all right, I'm going to take this really seriously, go to drum corps now and do that? Because I didn't meet you until Blast. I, mean, maybe, yeah. I think you guys have known each other before that, but what got you through that drum corps? What was that drum corps experience like at Boston Crusaders? I know we mentioned that in the intro, but like, what said, I want to take this seriously, I'm going to go to Boston, and I'm going to take this to the next level? Um, I... It was, I think, my my sophomore year of high school or going in. I was 15, and there was two girls that were in band, like my age, and they both had marched Americanos the year mm. before. Wow. Rest and in peace. came back. Yeah. Yeah. Americanos. <laughs> and came they were, like, back great, though. Some, Let's they out. were. They yeah. were killing. <laughs> they were really good. Yeah. Um, and th so they showed me some videos, and I'm like, this is really cool. And the... Uh, this was 2000 and Boston just did their red show and everybody mm -hmm. was loving that red show. And I remember watching it and I was like, okay, Americanos are cool, but I want to be in that group. Like yes. that's, that's the one. So the plan was like, what if I, what if I audition for Boston? If I don't make it, I'll go to Americanos. Sorry, Americanos. But that was like my game plan. <laughs> mm -hmm. and I didn't think I would make it. And my parents, it was like, you know, getting in the fall time, uh, my parents agreed to let me go to an audition camp because it was at South Plantation High School, like down in South Florida. Yeah, so I remember they they're like, yeah, you, you can go. The Paladins, like, you can go to this audition camp. And my mom told me years later, she never thought I would make it. She's like, oh, he won't make it. You just pay for the camp <laughs> fee and then that'll be the end of it. She said it was the most expensive Christmas gift. Oh, wow. That, uh, yeah. That, but, uh, but yeah, that, that was it. And I kind of got into it and, and, was in Boston. I was I was young to start, and that first year really, it really tried me. That that was like probably it, looking back one of the hardest years of my life, or like three months out of my life, just going from like this like awkward, shy, overweight, you know, out of shape like tuba player, and and like you know shedding weight and learning how to communicate and not being you know I was kind of a mama's boy. I was like you know. My mom did music and I was home and I was just kind of like every any one of my siblings know I'm, I'm the number one in the family. So I was, <laughs> I was always kind of that kid. And to be in an environment where nobody cares what your ranking is inside your family, mm -hmm. you know, like, can you can you move? And I can I can always play. But moving was was my challenge. So that kicked my butt. And then when I got through it, that was like, I'm, I'm doing this again. Like, this is it. And the next year was like a different year. And that's always a thing for rookies. Like rookies go in and they think, oh, my gosh, this is going to be terrible year after year. And the next year was like the best year of my life back mm -hmm. then at that point, you know. And then I, I did it year after year and for, for five years. And, um, and that, was, that was everything. I mean, the, my life was Boston Crusaders. Almost, almost unbalanced too much into drum corps, you know, from a healthy standpoint of like, managing other things in life like grades and money and yeah. you know all that stuff at a young age but but that taught me a lot of discipline it taught me how to focus and i mean ever all the major life skills that you should know that you need to develop in like your late teens and, and early 20s like that was it and you guys know that i mean like I'm sure it's the same for for you all as well but i mean boston was great with with tradition and that type of respect and and bringing that across and and i I loved it. And that's why, you know, to this day, I'll, I'll go back there in a heartbeat to help out and teach and, and whatever they need. Because that organization has done so much for me um, coming up. Yeah, so yeah We have a special place in our hearts for Boston. Like, that's one of those places yeah. that has that tradition, has that love, has that alumni. That family vibe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I love that place. Yeah, shout out to Boston. Yeah. Yeah. And it's cool seeing you develop and grow up in that time, too, really. Because you're talking about, like, 15, 16 till you aged out. Like yeah. the, the kid from Broca, the kid from Boca that we're talking about, like really going through your time away from home in a group of so many different type of people, so many different type of mindsets. Mm -hmm. That's the time where you're really developing and it turns you into the person that you are today. And it's so cool to see that progression. I mean, that if I hadn't done that, everything, everything else past that point, that was really the bridge mm. like that. And honestly, blast after that. Those are the two things. If I hadn't have done those two things, like nothing else would have fallen into place the way it did because that that set up opportunities like oh you do this you can teach now you do this mm -hmm. you can perform and and it, it taught me how to be a performer um so that that was the the number one most important thing and i had really great teachers that encouraged me and put me in front of the ensemble and like cheered me on and 
and that was awesome like that feeling of being young and having someone like believe in you as yeah. a person uh was really cool it's so, so important you know you and i have a very parallel uh life it, during those times i feel we're both both from south florida we both did the five years in the drum corps we were both way too invested in it i think yeah. it passed the healthy level but it, it changed the trajectory of our lives and um then both ended up at blast didn't know each other during the time we were marching drum corps right. but i just i just mm -hmm. think that's really cool and uh, i can totally relate to everything that you just said about that and just continue to be so grateful for this that activity the activity of drum corps because it's really just I'm here now because of, of that. And yeah. so many opportunities in my life have happened because of that decision. Yeah. And it just merges so many different worlds, you know, like I wouldn't have known either one of you had it not been for those mm -hmm. experiences, drum corps or blast. We've literally been to the edges of Japan together. All <laughs> of the prefectures. We've yeah. been to South Korea together. We've yeah. been all over the United States together multiple times. And there's not many people that can say that where we're from, especially even in the activity, but especially in the real world, who can say that they've made these kind of these kind of collaborations and mm. have really maximized the activity to really thrive with some people like this? This is, I'm really fortunate, really yeah. fortunate. And you know what's cool too is, you know, we're we're in a position like we're talking about music, we're talking about this kind of stuff, we're talking about the arts. But there's there's people that went and did drum corps that were never maybe involved in the arts and the music or anything afterwards. But they'll still tell you like this was one of the most important things that they've done in their life to set them up to be a successful lawyer, to be a successful accountant, or whatever they do in life, to be a great salesperson and how to present yourself because you learn those skills. Mm -hmm. And you know, without you know, drum corps was obviously that bridge for me from a career standpoint but just from a emotional and a well-being standpoint and just understanding and, and, and being well-rounded like it taught me all of that stuff yeah um, like how much would you not have seen if it weren't for drum corps especially oh, like yeah. we get stuck in our zones like if i was just mm -hmm. in the south bronx or you were just in south florida you were just in boca like right what would we not have been exposed to that have really developed us into who we are today? Bill, you're one of the like most hip dudes I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but And culturally, just like the variety that you have had let into your life because mm -hmm. of your experiences, it just clearly has molded you into the dope, cool human being that you are right now. And I, I'm curious of like, what would have happened if you would have just been stuck in one place or, you know, have those opportunities or your mom just saying, you know what, give it a shot. You might not make it, but give it a go and then that's like the best thing anybody could do though as like a, at a young age just travel and get mm -hmm. perspective i mean you know it's like you see and it's not that if people who never travel don't have perspective but it you're forced to learn how other people live and other cultures mm -hmm. live yes. and just within the united states drum corps you know we you, you tour probably been to 30 different states because of drum corps in a summer and that taught me like wow, this, this is very different here versus here. I'm only used to seeing the South Florida bubble and it exposes you to all those different places. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, traveling to different countries, like nobody cares if you're from the United States when you're in yeah. a different country. You only, you're the only one who cares. <laughs> and it's like, can you speak the language? Can you get by? Or are you a decent person? Like those are the things. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, having perspective of traveling to me is, is the, one of the best things you could do at a young age. And if you have those opportunities, to do something like drum corps or into to tour to different places, you know, that's, that's exposes you to so much and so much networking that comes out of that too, mm. from a, from a career sp perspective. Yeah. Exposure, networking yeah. experiences. Yeah. Like it's, it's that life experience that you gain that by traveling, by doing these things that you, you can't learn it from a book. You can't learn it in school. You have to live it. You have to go, you have to experience it. And I'm, glad that we were all kind of young and dumb to just go and yeah. do it and uh, drop things it. at a yeah. drop of the hat. I'm going to go on this tour because I have this opportunity because we were doing what we love to do, but we didn't have the kind of responsibilities that we have now. And we were able to do that. And I'm, I'm grateful for it. Yeah, absolutely yeah. grateful. And it, sure. I'm just thinking about, I, if it weren't for those things, I would have never seen a palm tree before. Just like I'm sure you guys would have never seen snow before. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of those <laughs> things. What do we do? What do we do without those experiences? You, you end up not developing as much as you could. You yeah. know? So you toured with Blast for quite some time. And that was a great experience. If you want to speak on that, please, by all means. I'm just curious, 
when you decided you made that decision because everybody at some point they're touring with something you have to, uh, to make a decision do I want to continue doing this or do I want to shift and do something different so I was just kind of curious when that mindset shift happened for you and what that was like yeah so I, I feel like blast in of itself taught me a lot of lessons you know I did it for five years basically kind of like I did drum corps but you know, it wasn't on 100% for five years. Mm -hmm. And when you tour as a touring artist, your goal is to stay touring. Like if this tour is done, you got to piggyback and get on the next thing. And I remember the, the first tour I did, it was the most money I've ever made at that time. And I was like, man, this is great. And I was in Japan and spending money and going out and having fun. And then I came back and I'm like, okay, well, I made it. This is it. Like <laughs> my, my career is here. And I was, I was living large. I'm like 23 years old, like feeling good. And, uh, and then that money started to just drift away real quick. And I'm thinking, Oh geez, what do I do? Like, and I, <clears throat> I got myself in a bad situation, um, that after that first tour and where, you know, like I just couldn't pay for things and have any money. And, and I was just stubborn and did, did not want to get like a, a regular job because I thought I had made it. I was I was stubborn. Mm -hmm. And the stubbornness, looking back, it has helped me to be stronger today and learn a lot of things kind of the hard way. Um, but it was after that first tour that I realized I have to I have to do something else. Like, this is it. I love touring. I love playing this show. But if I want to self sustain in this, I have to build it more. So going back and doing a couple more tours after that, <clears throat> I started to shift my mindset to like, you know, how do I create something else? And and I wanted to really, as a, as a professional, recreate that same environment that I was in in Blast in terms of touring and, you know, having this big production and having the level of organization. Like, I love that. You, you don't have to think when you're, in a tour like that because oh, yeah. like all right here's your hotel here's mm -hmm. what time to get on the bus and here's what time you get to the theater and you stretch and you warm up and if you just follow those things it, it's easy and i like that type of organization and i wanted to be able to recreate that but with my name as the brand um so you know that <clears throat> i think blast kind of taught me that because especially in those early tours there's a lot of examples of people that have left that show and have been successful and, and, and built careers for themselves within the performing arts. And I saw some of those examples early on and I'm like, okay, I can do that. Like I remember seeing, you know, Adam Rappa was a big example to me and he doesn't even know it. But, um, you know, if those of you who don't know Adam, he's a phenomenal trumpet player and he was the soloist on the first tour that I <clears throat> was on. And, um, you know, he did he did an album, I think it was called Life on the Road, and he did this album, and I remember he sold it uh, on all the tours, and that was inspiring to me. And then seeing, like, he had a website, and I remember he was, like, backstage working on the website. I'm like, how do you make that website? And he's like, oh, I use this program. So I was like, I'm going to download this program. I'm going to use it. And I think it was, like, when iWeb was a thing, mm -hmm. like, Max. So I made my first website, and it was garbage, but it was, like, that was, like, the, kind of the beginning of everything. And from a money standpoint, anytime I'm filling out paperwork and, you know, they ask you the question, like, how long have you worked at your current job? I always put that date as the date that my career started. Um, nice. It was that first tour with Blast because that that's when I really had to figure things out and um, and and realize if, if I'm going to do this, like, I have to do this. But, you know, there was a few people in there that were really strong influences to to continue and find that other thing and realize that, like, you know, when I was younger, I always thought that, or at least I was told when you go to high school, you, when you graduate, if you're in music, you either, if you're a good player, you play. And if you're not good, you teach. Like that's literally <laughs> what I was told, yeah. which mm -hmm. is terrible advice. It's <laughs> why you have like bad music teachers yeah. that like, are, cause they weren't great musicians or like, you know, students of the game to begin with. Um, but that's, that's, that's all I knew is the path. And that's like what a guidance counselor would tell you right. in high school. So this is the first time I realized I'm like, you can work backstage. Like you can, there's people that get paid to do lighting and like they're, mm -hmm. they study this stuff and there's people that do all these different things. So I, I realized there's like a whole bunch of different things that I can get involved in. And that was like when I started to branch out and try to diversify and, and do all the things. Um, and it, it took a while, like leaving blast was the, probably the hardest decision I had to make 
and I had to make it a couple times because they've called me tours after that, like, hey, would you come back and, and join this? And that was like a really hard no because it, it wasn't like I just like, all right, here I'm making this money and now I'm making it again. Like I had to take a dip for you know, a little bit in order to build up that business and, and make mistakes and, and figure that stuff out. Uh, but man, blast that, that taught me how to be a professional musician, you know, where like drum corps was like, you know, for me, if, if you don't know, anybody listening doesn't know, I didn't go to college. Um, I don't have a college degree. Uh, and you know, for someone who doesn't have that, it's always a thing in the back of your head, like, oh man, mm-hmm. they're going to judge you. You don't have a degree. You don't have this. And I've, I've made it like my point to be educated and be well-versed and, and not let it stop me. You know, you, when you're young, you think like, oh, you can't, you can't teach at a school if you don't have a degree. You can't teach at a college. And I've, I've taught at colleges all over the world. So, you know, but that, that, those are the things that like early on that I was just like kind of hindered by and I had to get past. And, um, and, and where drum corps was kind of like my undergrad, like blast was kind of like graduate school for me mm-hmm. in terms of like, this is how you be a professional. And, and if you're not a professional, you get sent home. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, right. you've seen that Absolutely. happen. Like, hey, you mess up, you're fired. Like, you're out. Yeah. That's Next. how it works. Yep. You party too hard. You're, and exactly. luckily, I was never caught partying too hard. Mm-hmm. And uh, I figured that out. <laughs> there was definitely those moments, but. Uh, oh, because you yeah, never, man, you but, never did though, Bill. I mean, oh you know, no, absolutely not. I was, I was. Play the show, go to ahead. sleep, wake up, do it again, right? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> This is a lot, I and mean, what a crazy road and just experience and all yeah. that. And and I love that you went down the the degree route too, because that is something in the back of a lot of people's heads, you know. And yes. the way the world the world's going now for the future, it's almost irrelevant, you know. The the experience and what you really bring to the table has proven to be the actual cause of people's success. And you have dove into the actual experience side of it versus the checks and balances of like what society says is correct or not. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that's <clears throat> it, it, it all depends on what you want to do. Like if you want to be, you know, a doctor, you've got to go to school like yeah, you, you have to, to you know, there's certain things you should probably go to school <laughs> um, or you may end up in a terrible lawsuit. Yes. And, um, but, you know, for to be a tuba player that plays hip hop and jazz, like there's honestly not a whole lot of schools that teach that stuff anyways, because it's not like a career path that's been charted out. So, you know, I. I admittedly dropped out of school early because I wasn't focused and I wasn't into it. And it that opened up this new door of like, I have to work even harder than everybody else to prove myself. And then looking back, I was just like, college is a business. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's, a mon- it's, it's about money and it's a business and it's, it serves a certain place for certain people. And I was just fortunate enough to not get myself in hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt. Yeah. And, and to be able to come out and be like, okay, I, I can do this without um, this thing. And it's also the blessing of that, of not going to school, it's made me work harder to kind of do those extra things that maybe I would have been a little bit more content, like, oh, I'm fine, I have that piece of paper. But it was like, you know, I have to, I have to go this extra little bit to, to prove myself and, and to figure those things out. So in hindsight, I'm actually, you know, people ask like, if you were to do it again, would you go back to school? Um, and no, I wouldn't go back to school because it forced me to learn a lot of lessons and Mm -hmm. it, it changed my work ethic. And I was never a really good student to be honest. And I'm, I consider myself a great student now because I love learning, but that environment was just not conducive to me. And you see that now. I mean, I'm a, I teach at high school, I teach at middle schools and colleges and some kids just aren't don't love that process and that system and I was one of those kids. I was in school because band was in school. You know, and that's the thing that like got me in there and uh, and that's the thing that keeps me going there to you know, provide kids that have that experience that that I had. So, I love yeah. that. I can yeah. go all day about the college thing. No, <laughs> I, I hear you. You know, what what you can learn uh living it living the experience playing the gigs learning from the people around you is invaluable Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. uh, i'm not trying to take away from college or anything like that because of course you learn tons of things there but there's something more if you don't have that experience you get out of college and it's like oh now what do i do yeah and and it's in in some ways a lot of catching up yeah what i love about your story bill is that you took a very streamlined approach to exactly what you wanted to do you knew that building the brand building the website like 
you wouldn't have gone to school for branding and marketing. You know what I'm saying? Right. So you not being there for you specifically really tied together the exact curriculum you needed to be successful at your craft without having to worry about your gen eds or specific things that you are either excelling at or not. Instead, you're like, okay, what do I need to do to get my name out there? What is this website thing and how does that benefit me? How could the, yeah. a new record benefit me? How could uh, branding my name and putting it out in the world while I'm on tour benefit me and my brand? And it's, a whole nother approach to what self-education really is. It is. And, you know, you go to school, the two biggest assets you can get as a musician going to school is skill acquisition and networking. Those are the two things. So you, you have to get an education no matter who you are. You got to learn. You get So whether it's in a formal environment or not in a formal environment, and you got to make those connections. Um, and that's why, you know, a lot of musicians, like people who go up to New York and, and go to school in New York are oftentimes – um, some of the more successful musicians in like places in, in Texas and Dallas area, like a lot of the people that come out of these these centers are, are more successful because of the networking aspect. Yeah. And networking, when you're playing with these all-star musicians, like you rise to that level and that, that's what gets you better. You know, if you're just stuck in a, in a, in a music class, in a lab, and you're, you're, everybody's at the same talent level, there's nothing to bring you up. You know, rising tide raises all ships. So, you know, you're in an ensemble and you're the worst person in the ensemble. That's the best place to be. And I've been great at finding those ensembles <laughs> to be in where I consider myself not the best player. Um, but, you know, that's that's the networking that comes from that. And that's where all the skills are developed. It's, it's like on this on the job training. And then you mess up and crash and burn. And then you go home and be like, all right, what did I do? Like, all right, what is this scale that I have to learn now? And then you figure that out and then you shed and then you go back to the next thing and you're like, I'm going to try it out. I learned that scale. And then you crash and burn again. <laughs> and then yeah. like, oh, crap, yeah. like what was that? And then you realize there's like another layer that you haven't uncovered yet. And then you go home and you're like, and to me, that's that's like the ongoing thing that continues today of like education that, that never ends. You know, like you, you're around people that are knowing and and know what's up and just by playing with them if you're self-aware in any sense of the form then you'll be able to figure things out and figure out what you need to work on and and, and grow so mm -hmm. to me that that was my college that's it's it was the on the job training and um and some very uncomfortable positions where you know and i i was watching your last podcast about anxiety and stuff and man like that, that was like crazy yeah. for me when i was <clears throat> when i was coming up and he was talking about some great things and, and putting in perspective and i think back to like moments where i was like a hot mess going on stage because i wasn't i wasn't like able i wasn't prepared to do some of the things that i was doing mm -hmm. but those moments are what built the character and then when you look back, you realize like, it's just, I'm just playing the tuba. Like who really cares? <laughs> it's not that deep, yeah. Yeah, you know, but I, I would get in my head about those things. But, um, but that, that was my schooling, like that just being with people that can play my butt off and, and networking with those people and making friends. Yeah. And then you guys push each other to the next level. I remember yeah. specifically us being in the green room together and, I'm playing like a video game or something and you're all like looking at the, a casting list or something. You're like, yo, dude, they got like Drumline Live is casting in a couple months. You'd be perfect. And I remember just being like, wait. And then that's when that whole like, yeah, touring, just how long can you stay touring? Like this thing's going to end. The lessons you learned the year before, you were like, bruh, <laughs> like yeah. you, you need to be Googling in this room right now because there's a lot of levels to this thing. And that just yeah. sparked a whole new side of me. So I guess the question for you would be what would be, like those steps to building that brand for someone that's brand new to this thing. What are those things that are in your head or lessons you learn throughout that brand building process? So <clears throat> building a brand to me comes down to one thing. You have to transcribe your image, what you want to be. You have to transcribe that. And mm. I, I learned that in jazz as a jazz musician, you, you learn the, the jazz language and improvisation by transcribing other musicians. You want to sound like Coltrane, you, you play that recording and you back it up and, and do it over and over and over again and, and learn those licks. And that's what jazz musicians do. And that's really what all musicians do. And a lot of us do that with everything and don't realize it from uh, a musical perspective, from the, you know, the clothes you wear. I remember when I saw... Uh, Roy Hargrove in, in, in concert, the late great Roy Hargrove, I saw him and he had the dopest like purple kicks on 
And I, I saw that. I was like, I, I have to get those. Right. I know I'm not going to play like Roy when I get those, but I have to get those shoes. Because I was like, it was like this image that I, I wanted to develop. And I was like, I love the color purple. That's it. I got purple back here. Like, that's that's the thing. So, and, and I went and got those shoes. And, you, you know, you do that with the way you dress. You see someone wear a shirt that you like or you see that kind of hat. And you're like, oh, I like that. That's dope. I'm going to take that. And I think when developing your brand and developing your career, that's largely the kind of thing that you have to do is you have to find those things and people doing the things that you love and take the things that you like and take away the things that you don't like about it. You know, for me, it was largely half of my, well, a lot of what I do is teaching and a lot of what I do is playing, at least early on. So I spent a lot of time transcribing musicians and and taking out some of the bad things that I saw and then transcribing teachers and they're like man I love what he does when he's working on this and I love what this person does and just stealing all of those things and those things unknowingly start to stack up and that's that's how you build your brand that's how you build your image I don't think it's so much of like you go in like knowing from day one like this is what this is i'm tuba visionary and this is what i'm going to do this is my brand and this is how i'm going to go you have to start somewhere like i made my first website and the first website was bad and then the second one gets a little bit better and then the next one gets a little bit better and you know i learned websites by watching other people's websites mm. I, I could tell you all the musicians over the years websites that i studied to get the ideas on my website like oh this guy's got music streaming now that's a thing how do I do that? It's, it's transcribing your image, you know, figuring out what you want to look like, what you want to sound like and what you want your life to be like. And that's going to change. Like you, what you transcribe is going to change just like your musical chase, you know, taste change over time. You may like one thing and then it goes into something else. I 10 years ago, I, I couldn't have told you that I'd be living where I live in the setup that I'm in and, and in this lifestyle. And I love it. But I I. You know, I was at a point in my life for a while where I was like, I'm going to tour. And I did, you know, over 10 years of just basically touring and touring. And now um, I love my home life. But, you know, that was a different, a newer image that I've been transcribing as I get a little bit older. And I, I don't want to live on the road anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think for any, and that, that goes for anything. That's not just music. That's like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a salesperson or if you're whatever you do and you're trying to build your brand, just Find the things that you like that other people do. And I think the big mistake that a lot of people make is they only look look inward to their like genre of expertise. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm a tuba player, I only look at tuba players and be like, how do I be like that tuba player? Because then you'll only be like a second off of that. Yeah. But as a tuba player, I, I would look towards other things like, all right, how is this? this this salesperson i remember studying like zig ziglar and studying sales techniques because i'm like oh this is interesting like how do i get into this yeah. and and studying all these different things and i studied website coding and i studied you know a lot of different stuff and that is what builds the brand you know so don't look just inward like look out and expand mm. and that that builds a diversity and strength in your career as well <sighs> Uh, but it's all about transcription. Yeah, I love I that. I wish I had a button for it. We got to get a button for that. Like, boom. Yeah. Oh, what, a, what a specific dis distinction as well, because I feel like that's one of your fortes, man, is that you use your experiences and combine that into your little gumbo to create who mm. Bill is versus, mm, gumbo. <laughs> versus the person that really does look inward and says, I'm going to be Bill. And then it's just like a second off or like basically a mm -hmm. swagger jacker that's not necessarily mm -hmm. has their yeah. own image. But that Bill that has his own experiences that loves hip hop, that loves jazz music, that loves the tuba, plus, but had this experience with the guitars and my neighbors mm -hmm. and blast and a touring musician and a record deal. And, uh, you know, what I'm saying there's so many layers to that, that only you could create this awesome gumbo that creates that image that you are. But it's a fine line because you could have just chose one person and just been like i'm gonna mm -hmm. do that or see what that is but no you chose one person and said what's that website sweet let me take that idea mixed with purple because i love it mixed with this with with that with that and you create such a beautiful brand and identity mm. i love that nailed it, it dude yes. you nailed it dude that's transcribe your image mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a clip. <laughs> Sorry. A golden nugget. Oh, man. That's a good one right there. So, you know, you are one of the people that just 
hustles. You're always hustling. You're always finding new ways to uh, teach, to perform. Just you're just you work hard. Bottom yeah. line, Bill's the kind um, of guy you unfollow because you're when you feel bad. Like <laughs> I'm not doing enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you're, you're always you're always looking for the next thing, and um, it's an, it's very inspiring. And I just want to kind of hear Thank your you. thoughts on. Uh, ways to create opportunities for yourself, either as a performer or uh, just a small business owner, an entrepreneur, ways to create some opportunities for yourself, uh, even when it might seem like there aren't any opportunities out mm -hmm. there because you're like the master at that. So please uh, drop some wisdom for us. So to me, creating an opportunity, you essentially have to do two things. You have to find what the problem is and you have to sell the fix to the problem like that's how you create business mm, it's, hold up say that yeah. again hold up you're not gonna just <laughs> skirt past that real quick Ooh, get your pens so, out folks hold up so you know and you you have to find whatever the problem is and you have to find the fix and sell the fix sell and the that's fix. that's mm. what you do like and for music a lot of time music is a fix it's the drug for all you know all of us especially in times like right now um so to me, that that is a big thing um, of doing that. And as a tuba player, I am no stranger to not having many opportunities kind of in the peripheral of, of what's available. You know, there's there's this old parable that, you know, myself and Drew and a few of us always use when we talk about um, building a career off of a weird instrument playing the tuba and drew plays the vibraphone yeah. that's why we always hang out because you know we <laughs> we've developed this like friendship of like we play awkward instruments but this is this is our thing but there's a story about two shoe salesmen and they're both hired by um a company to go overseas to this foreign country um kind of this desolate country and assess the market for new shoes so shoe salesman one goes there comes back and reports and says hey this is just it's not a great opportunity um you know nobody actually wears shoes here like it's it's they're very poor there's there's just not a market i'm sorry I, there's not much i can do the second shoe salesman goes over there comes back and reports and says hey this is a great opportunity nobody wears shoes i'm a shoe salesman like it's an open market like everything is available for, for us and to me as a tuba player it's that same thing like there's there's a ton of people all around the world that play tuba, but there's also a lot of people around the world that have no idea what the tuba is. And to me, that's the opportunity. So instead of looking in, you know, for these traditional jobs, like trying to get an orchestra gig, and there's only 15 full-time orchestras left in the US, like why compete for that? I'll never be that strong of a player in my mind. I'd rather just develop my own opportunities. I see all the people that have no idea what the tuba is as an opportunity to bring that instrument forward and develop the new things. Because people are always looking for something new and hot and exciting. And I think for me, that's always been kind of my X factor that I play in a different instrument. And I, I can't say that maybe it would be the same if I played like guitar or something. But even as a guitarist, like if you find your style, your style will always be different than anybody else. And that's what you have to, to really dig into. So, you know, coming up, that's that's really the thing is 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 believing in yourself and seeing those opportunities where there aren't things and honestly oftentimes you just have to create those opportunities because you know most of the business ventures that i've been involved in there was no dollar signs involved in the beginning nobody has ever like invested in my career like hey we're going to produce this album for you. We're going to write this book yeah. for you. We're going to do this. We're going to produce this tour. Most of them started with me going into debt to, to, to fund. Um, and it's just like starting any business. You start a restaurant, you have to invest a lot of money into it to get it off the ground and you don't expect to get it back till later. Um, so, you know, you have to just have faith and some of those opportunities may pan out and some of them may just crash and burn. But most of them that crash and burn typically do because you just kind of like drift away at you know after a certain point you kind of give up i i feel like anything could be something um as long as you stick with it long enough uh, but there's opportunity out there if if i as a tuba player and i play tuba bass trumpet bass guitar conch shell 
Yeah. <laughs> if I can, mm-hmm. if I can get by doing that and and have a roof over my head, have a car, mortgage, and 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 have a normal life, like you can do anything. Um, I've always felt like, man, I could, I, I would go back and do like sales training courses because like I, I took courses when I was younger because I before I was serious in the music, I sold cars and I sold life insurance while I was like kind of in college, kind of in college, like doing this. <laughs> And, but I learned a lot doing that. And I, I was a terrible car salesman because I didn't like ripping people off. But now selling myself is way easier because I believe in my product. And if you believe in your product, all that stuff will come. But you have to believe in yourself first. We hope you enjoy part one of the real life of a freelance musician with Bill Muter. Part two is filled with some great stuff that you won't want to miss. So make sure to check that out next. You can follow Bill on social media at Tuba Visionary and on his website, tubavisionary.com. Follow our podcast on Instagram at Mind, Body, and Pockets and subscribe to our YouTube channel for video episodes and bonus clips. If our content has been bringing you value, please go ahead and rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts. This is going to help us build our community and reach more people in the marching arts and beyond. So we'd really appreciate it if you could help us out. Thanks for the support. And as always, keep taking steps to level up your life.